Good morning, friends. Welcome on this beautiful day. Good, happy Mother's Day. Um, I learned something new yesterday, which is always nice to learn something new. Uh, if most of us are thinking about the origins of Mother's Day, we think about Anna Jarvis, <coughs> who uh, started a petition for an official day to recognize mothers in 1907. And it finally was proclaimed an official holiday by Woodrow Wilson in 1914. However, 37 years before that, um, Julia Ward Howell had a um, Mother's Day proclamation that she issued, and she wanted to establish a Mother's Peace Day to honor and support mothers who lost sons and husbands to the carnage of the Civil War. It would be a day dedicated to the eradication of war. Julia Ward Howe was a prominent American abolitionist, feminist, poet, author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. She nursed and tended wounded during the Civil War and worked with widows and orphans of soldiers on both sides. She realized that the effects of the war go far beyond the killing of soldiers in battle. The devastation she witnessed during the Civil War inspired her to call out for women to rise up through the ashes and devastation, urging a Mother's Day dedicated to peace. Today's commercialized celebration of candy, flowers, gift certificates, lavish restaurant meals bear little resemblance to Howe's original idea. There's nothing wrong with that. We need to honor and celebrate. proclamation she wrote in 1870, which she explains in her own impassioned words the goals of the original holiday. Arise, all women who have hearts, whether your baptism be that of water or of tears. Say firmly, we will not have great questions decided by irrelevant agencies. Our husbands shall not come to us reeking with carnage for caresses and applause. Our sons shall not be taken from us to unlearn all that we have been able to teach them of charity, mercy, and patience. We women of one country will be too tender of those of another country to allow our sons to be trained to injure theirs. From the bosom of the devastated earth, a voice goes up with our own. It says, disarm, disarm. The sword is not the balance of justice. Blood does not wipe out dishonor, nor violence indicate possession. As men have often forsaken the plow and the anvil at the summons of war, let women now leave all that may be left of home for a great and earnest day of counsel. Let them meet first as women to bewail and commemorate the dead. Let them then solemnly, solemnly take counsel with each other as to the means whereby the great human family can live in peace, each learning after his own time the sacred impress, not of Caesar, but of God. In the name of womanhood and humanity, I earnestly ask that a general congress of women throughout, without limit of nationality, may be appointed and held at some place deemed most convenient and at the earliest period consistent with its objects to promote the alliance of the different nationalities, the amicable settlement of international questions, the great and general interests of peace. We can only imagine what our world today would be like if Julia's vision for peace had occurred. Please rise and join in singing our first hymn, number 11 in the worship and song, <laughs> Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
Now's the time for announcements. Does anybody on Zoom have an announcement they want to share? Anybody in person have an announcement? I'd like to remind you that the May monthly meeting for business will be next Sunday, May 15th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Everyone is invited to attend and help us conduct the business of the meeting. This is Becky McClung. McClung. I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't jump, jump in. in. I just, just want to say something, say something about, about the, the um, garden, garden group, group garden rock group, group that is going to be starting their first their session is may 14th, 14th which, is which is next saturday, saturday. Um, at, um, Avon, at Avon garden, garden. I, will I will send out, send out another, another email, email this week, this week. We'll, be we'll be meeting at 9 30 and bring us back lunch, lunch. Uh, just, uh, to just to tell you that this that is going to be a twice a month gathering, gathering um, um, half, half in person, in person and half, and half via, Zoom. via Zoom. And, and I, just I just invite anybody who anybody has not done it done before to consider joining, joining us and look for the email, email coming out coming later, out later this, this week. week. Any other announcements? I don't have my program up here with me. <laughs> Ned Steele is going to do our Minute for Hope and Healing today. Good morning. Good morning. I, I'm not sure how others who have received this assignment have gone about it, but I... Uh, I just looked up the word hope and healing and was surprised to find that not many people couple those together. I could find them separately. And so I had said, yes, I would do this. And then I found myself thinking, <laughs> but then I remembered something from 2006. I remembered a, a book I had purchased that would get us from the opening song to hope and healing. So from Stephen Baumann's book called Simple Truths, very quick looking yes, cover. You know the book well. Well, then I can't put anything over on you. He says this about our opening song, and it will get us to another story, both brief. These were one minute radio programs that he did for a number of years in uh, New York City. The church he's been pastoring uh, for you United Methodists like myself since 1987 and is just retiring from that church this year. What an assignment. He says, a television commercial caught my attention. What brought my gaze from the paper to the flickering screen was the music. 
a rousing rendition of the last movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, whose melody is known as Ode to Joy, or the hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. When I looked up, I saw a large group of crash test dummies singing exultant praises to a new model of luxury car, a Lexus. And with that, I confess my heart sank. Not that the ad was not clever and well done because it was all of that, but it struck me as symbolic of our time that crash test dummies would be singing praises to a car utilizing one of the most remarkable achievements of Western music, strangely emblematic of how divested our culture is and has become with the sense of what is sacred in life. And earlier in a broadcast of his, he spoke to what he thought was the sacred in life. When it comes, he said in an earlier broadcast, in moving from hopelessness to hopefulness, I believe a choice is often involved. And he says at the end of that broadcast, the choice is to move from where we find ourselves now to hope and healing, the twin gifts of grace. I'm glad we've married those two things at this congregation. Other people may not put them together too much, but we do on purpose every Sunday here moving to hope and healing is a direction. There ends the reading. Well, I hope you're not following your program because I obviously am not following it. So. <laughs> I'm just making it up as I go. <laughs> However, this is a time for announcements. I'm not, oh my gosh. For the offering. <laughs> and we have several ways you can donate. If uh, you can do it with PayPal, and the instructions are on the um, website. Uh, we have offering plates at the back of the room for uh, checks and monetary gifts. And if you want to bring food for the food pantries, there are baskets in the gathering area that you can put the, those donations in. And you can also put money donations in the baskets if you want to. We just thank God for the gifts he has given us and ask that he bless the way we use them. Well, let us stand now for our closing song. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's scary is that I saw several people start to go. <laughs> Bill Smith got you on that one, didn't I? <laughs> we remember, oh God, those persons whose experience as a mother or with a mother have not been positive. We know, oh God, that most of us do the best we can but that not all of us are equally equipped. So God, where there have been failures to parent, we ask your mercy and your renewal. We give thanks today, O oh God, for women and for their influence in this world. We repent of our failure to listen carefully and tenderly to their priorities, realizing how much different, how much better this world would be had we listened. So, O oh God, on this day we celebrate the wisdom of women. We are grateful for their presence in our lives. This is our prayer this Sabbath day morning. Amen. Well, now let us sing a song, uh, hymn number 240 in worship and song, The Lone Wild Bird. Thank you. 
may remain seated for this one. Every time we sing this song, I think of Don Adams. I think he really likes this one. So. Well, that's one way. No. <laughs> Is he with the birds today? Okay, well, there you go. Well, I was talking with a man not long ago who learned during the course of our conversation that I was a Quaker pastor. And he brightened up and he said, I used to be a pastor. Oh, I said, that's interesting. How long did you serve as a pastor? And he said, well, it was a long time ago and I only lasted three months. And I knew there had to be a good story there. I just knew it. How do you only last three months? It turns out he forgot Mother's Day. He said, after thinking about it for a moment, he said, actually, I think they would have forgiven that. But the next week, I preached on women and the church and quoted from Genesis about men ruling over women. And I mentioned 1 Corinthians about women being silent in church, and that turned out to be my last Sunday. And I didn't know this man well. I had just met him, so I didn't feel free to call him a bird brain. But I thought it. I thought it. I said, do you still believe those things? Uh, and he said no, that he had gotten married. <laughs> And his wife had straightened him out, and I say, good for her, good for her. So happy Mother's Day, women. And greetings, greetings from a church that doesn't believe you should be ruled by anyone but yourself. And if you want to speak, feel free. If you're not a mother, we still celebrate you. Today, we honor all those women who create, nurture, and love. Some women give birth to children. Some women give birth to ideas. Some women give birth to transformative social movements. We honor you. 
and applaud the many and various ways you have nurtured life. We begin with an apology. Religion, perhaps more than any other institution, has conspired to keep women down. The American suffragist Elizabeth Cady Stanton once said, the Bible and the church have been the greatest stumbling blocks in the way of women's emancipation. We can talk until we are blue in the face how the church reveres women, how the church elevates women, but when Christianity's largest denomination still does not permit women to serve as priests, when a religious majority in the Supreme Court conspires to deny women their medical and reproductive freedom, when 28,000 Southern Baptist churches do not permit women to lead, when 17 million Mormons worldwide will not permit women to serve in the priesthood, the church's words of reverence for women ring hollow. We've been talking about what it means to be spiritual, contrasting religion and spirituality. I want to continue our exploration by observing that religions, not all religions, but certainly a plurality of them in history, have endeavored to keep women down and women powerless, and have done so by claiming that the subjugation of women is God's will. Now we contrast this with spirituality, which I think at its heart has the purpose always to connect and value and affirm. I believe true spirituality believes women were not intended to be managed, but emancipated. Spirituality speaks not of conquest and control, but of connection and liberation. When our Christian ancestors encountered strong and independent women. They called them witches and put them to death. A warning to women everywhere to know their place and stay there. Philip Smith, writing in the academic journal Historical Social Research, estimated that from 1400 to 1700 AD, up to one million women in Europe and America were accused of witchcraft. One million women and half of them were put to death. The hidden history of the abuse of women. They did this with the full approval of the church. And then we became civilized. So rather than killing powerful and free-thinking women, we forbid them from owning property, made them stay with abusive husbands, denied them a voice in political matters, and still forbid them from terminating an unwanted or dangerous pregnancy. This is personal for me. I had an aunt who died from a dangerous pregnancy because she was not able to get the abortion her doctor said she needed to save her life. When we peer behind this grim curtain, we see the hand of oppressive religion pulling the strings. When women expressed great spiritual truths, they were corralled told what they could and could not say, what they could and could not feel, what they could and couldn't do. But spirituality never corrals. It never controls. It seeks only to enlighten 
and illuminate and liberate. Though I am not a woman, when I hear a woman say, I am spiritual, but not religious, I am hearing a woman realize that she has been ill-served and abused by religion, though has not lost her passion for truth, meaning, and beauty. I hear her say that though religion has tried to silence her, she will nevertheless persist. For too many years, our image of the perfect woman was related to her willingness and ability to serve men. She was not valued for her intelligence, for her insight, for her creativity, for her strength, but valued only for her compliance and submission. Wives, obey your husbands, religion told her. Cover your head, keep silent, bear children, don't argue, know your place. But know this, compliance and submission are the dreaded enemies of true spirituality. Compliance and submission are the dreaded enemies of true spirituality, which serves always to emancipate and empower, especially those who've been held down and held back. Since it is Mother's Day, I think naturally of my own mother and her life. My mother had within her body 78 organs, of which the womb was only one. When that was removed, her value was in no way diminished. I remember my mother telling me of the day in 1963, she told religion to stop concerning itself with her womb. She had had five children in six years and one Sunday morning sat through a homily given by a priest telling her birth control was a sin. Afterwards, my mother, who had never had a fear of anyone wearing any kind of uniform, went up to him and asked him, are you going to help me raise all the children you want me to have? And he drew up and said, that is not my business. And she said, exactly, exactly. And that is the day my mother went on birth control. I loved my mother, loved my mother. There isn't a day that passes that I don't think of her, that I don't miss her, that I don't cherish her memory. I am grateful she gave me life, but I am even more grateful for her strength, her intelligence, and her refusal to be reduced to a womb. In the last days of her life, my mother was not a religious woman. She was, however, deeply, deeply spiritual and walked freely and joyfully among the fragrant and gorgeous mysteries of life. May you and I do the same. Friends, let us stand and sing together number 246, I've Got Peace Like a River.
So there was a woman who used to pastor this meeting. Her name was Elijah Armstrong Cox. And she began what is now a global organization, United Society of Friends Women International. If you've heard people stand and make mention of USFW, that's what that is. When I became a pastor, and wanted to last more than three months, I went to my superintendent, Bob Garris, and said, Bob, do you have any hints for longevity in ministry? And he told me this, watch and see what USFW is doing and follow them. I'm now in my 39th year of pastoral ministry because I've always remembered that. Here's the thing. Quakers, over the course of our long history, have had, unfortunately, sadly, many splits. Always, without exception, begun by men, arguing over arcane scriptures and points of theological difference. Every one of them. In all of those splits, USFW has never split and to this day works together around the world to further the passions of Quakerism, feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, ministering to the brokenhearted. So friends, no matter your gender, be a USFW woman. Hold before yourself their priorities of unity and compassion and wisdom. And if you notice in your life that they are going one direction and you are going another, trust me when I tell you you are on the wrong path <laughs> and that you must correct it. So for the gifts of women today, for their stubborn insistence on remaining united when the rest of us are finding reasons to divide. We are grateful. We are grateful. So, if you are blessed to be standing near a woman today, shake her hand and say thank you. <laughs> Go in peace, friends.